today we have Janet, um, our co-founder, my co-founder for the Ross Wonders, here to discuss some science with us and answer questions. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Janet, to introduce what the topics are today and let people uh, ask questions. Okay. Hi, everybody. This is um, just going to be a casual conversation about all things related to Ross One Science. And I'm mostly here to answer your questions or to cover whatever topics you find interesting. But I did want to start out with saying this morning, the FDA gave repetrectinib a breakthrough designation, yay, which is the first step towards getting the drug approved. That doesn't mean that the approval is going to show up really quickly. We might be lucky to get it within the next year, but that's still moving in the right direction. So um, there's all sorts of topics related to science. We could talk about um, Ross one drugs and how TKIs and how they work. We can talk about acquired resistance. We can talk about the research the Ross Wonders are doing. We can talk about the real world data um, round table we did last week. We could talk about drug development, whatever tickles your fancy. So does anybody have burning or even only tickling questions you'd like to ask? I was actually digging for something that I wanted to ask about because it's like everybody knows what this certain thing is and I have no clue, but I can't find it yet. So I'll keep digging while, <laughs> while you guys talk. What, what's the general area? It, it's something to do with biomarker marker testing, but it's, it's some level that I keep hearing, you know, my blah, blah, PO, I don't know, some sort of level that, that people talk about and I have no idea what they're talking about. Okay. I'll mark that down as biomarker oh, testing. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I'll find it and and um, and if I okay. don't find it, I'll send it later. All right. Anything else? Grab people right away. Otherwise, I I can blather about biomarker testing. Okay. Um. Somebody posted in the group recently a concern about their biomarker testing because their initial testing was positive for ROS1 and the follow-up testing was negative. And supposedly both tests were from the same biopsied tissue. Well, there's a, a lot of reasons why this could happen. Um, one, tumors are not uniform. You can have ROS1 positive cells. You can have other types of cancer cells. You can have normal cells in there and biopsies don't always get the cancer cells. I and mean, when I had my, my second biopsy after my, my uh, second progression and they were trying to get to a really difficult tumor and they, they did a procedure called an electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. It's really cool. They put you on a plate and put a plate on your chest and track where the tip of the probe goes in your chest and the doctor can see it on a CT scan so he can make sure he's really getting to the tumor. And by all accounts, he got a good sample of the tumor, but there wasn't any cancer cells in it. It was only inflammation. And that actually happens in about 20% of tissue biopsies in lung cancer, because they have to go and thread it through all these airways with a really small needle, or they're trying to come in from the outside. So one problem might be they didn't get a good sample of cancer in both of the tissue samples on the slides that were sent for testing. Another one might be that um, the part of the tumor that they got the first time in the first sample has ROS1 and the other one doesn't. Um, the best uh, molecular pathologists who do these tests will take the slide and take out all of the normal cells, leaving only the cancer cells so that when they test it, they're getting a real good measure of what's going on in the cancer cells. If somebody doesn't do that, and they say run a fish test, which was the first one that we had available to us that tests only for ROS1, it might come back and say there's only 5% ROS1 in the sample, which is considered negative. But if it's 5% ROS1 and the rest of it was all normal cells, then actually it should have been positive for ROS1. So testing is, is tricky. 
there are um, some other reasons why it might not work is the testing method that they used. There are three ways of testing for ROS1. One is called FISH, which is fluorescent in situ hybridization. And I can't remember what the H stands for, but essentially they stain the cells and it looks at the DNA and looks at where the DNA strand broke. It has little probes that attach to it and they light up and they fluoresce. And then they manually look in the microscope and count the number of fluorescent spots. And you're technically positive if they count only over 15% of it. But even that can be a false positive because you're only measuring where the DNA strand broke. It doesn't tell you what broke it. Then there's the one that's more common, like you get for foundation medicine and a lot of the others. It's um, a broad panel using what they call next generation sequencing. And that's looking at particular genes and what they look like. But that can be give you a false negative if they are not running, um, running it enough to find all of the cells. Um, one person explained it to me as like, think of it as a piece of real estate. You actually physically have this little disc and they're putting this, they, they put all of the cells essentially in a blender and mush them up and pour them in there. And it looks at this channel and is looking for particular genes. And you can tell it to look for five genes and it will then go through the process um, 100 times, or you can look for 100 genes and it only looks five times. Well, some of our gene mutations are only detectable if you really make some, many, many passes. And if you're looking for some of the panels that are looking for 500 genes, they might miss it. Also, because ROS1 is a fusion, you have to do a different test than you do looking for point mutations like EGFR. Also, ROS1 is, um, they're finding they can detect it better if they're actually looking at RNA from the cell instead of DNA. So, you know, testing is fraught with issues. The one patient that recently posted in the group, it looks like she was tested with IHC, which is immunohistochemistry, which is looking for certain stains, and that can have a high false negative rate. So right now the guidelines say if you test for one on one kind of test and it's negative, try another kind of test and see if it comes out positive. Um, but that said, you know, this is still not a perfect science, and sometimes they get it wrong. We're also getting more people in the group now that we've been around long enough that are developing resistance mechanisms that involve mutations in other genes. We've had patients in the group who've had RET, ALK, EGFR, and MET so far. Um, we're all still learning about how all this works. So I have a question that goes with that, if you have a minute. So I've had sure. this nodule that's been waffling, well, it appeared, and then it waffles every now and again, but it's not really going anywhere now. <clears throat> but if it were to, I take it, it would make some sense to do another biopsy of it. And because uh, I have fish originally done <clears throat> in um, 2016, <clears throat> that would maybe make sense to have it checked to that particular spot. Uh, if something were to progress, I take it. Well, um, so one option is liquid biopsy if you have a progression. However, if your TKI is effectively inhibiting your ROS1, mm -hmm. then that, that's cancer tumor probably isn't shedding that type of cell and it's not behaving like cancer. And so the liquid biopsy comes back negative, even though you still have the ROS1 cells in your body, but they're being inhibited so they don't show up. But what if something if we, was progressing, would it show up? Well, if it depends it on how it's to that crizotinib? It depends on how it's progressing. Um, some of the liquid biopsies can pick up our resistance mechanisms that are still on the ROS1 gene, and some can't. Mm -hmm. um, but if you had an off-target resistance, which means it's not involving ROS1, it's one of the other genes, liquid biopsy would hopefully pick that up. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's not worth doing another biopsy because, gosh, it's hard to get in there and get lung biopsies unless you're progressing. 
Right. If you're progressing, it might be worth getting the tissue so you can determine the mechanism of resistance. Um, most of our drugs that are available work on specific resistance mechanisms. And if you have a different kind, then there's no point you're going on that TKI. In some cases, if you develop these other off-target mechanisms, you still want to inhibit the ROS1 because you've still got ROS1 cancer, but you need to figure out what to do about the other one in addition. And combining some of the, some of them have TKIs, like RET has an experimental TKI, MET has an approved TKI, EGFR and ALK have approved TKIs, but combining some of these TKIs could be really toxic. So it's, it's a whole new world. I have a friend who developed a brain MET. She knew she was ALK positive, from the outset, and she had developed MET as a resistance mechanism, and she just had another rapid progression of a brain MET. They did a surgery and looked at the sample, and she now has also EGFR mutation, and they have no idea what to do. Um, cheery note, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. So did how long do they bust in Janet? Pardon? Yeah. Um, what, hap what, do you, what happens if you are considered NED and you have progression? Would they still, and, and would they still find ROS1 in another cell? Well, you- How do you know that you have ROS1 or don't have ROS1 if you've been NED for you know, a year or two years? Well, yeah, you'd want to do a biopsy. Um, but I, I want to revisit NED. NED still means we don't have a means of detecting anything. It doesn't mean you have absolutely no microscopic cancer right. cells in your body. Right. And in fact, we've even seen cases where people were on an effective TKI and their PET scan didn't glow, but they could still physically see the tumor. You know, so it just meant the cells weren't acting like cancer. And so they didn't show up on the PET scan. Um, if you have progression, it's always best to try and do a biopsy. If you're NED, you really don't know what the resistance mechanism is. There have been people who were NED who developed an on-target resistant mechanism. They still had ROS1. They had to get a different TKI that treated their particular resistance mechanism, but it was still a ROS1 fusion that was driving the cancer. There are, excuse me, also people that pick up other things. I mean, we, we've even had a couple people transform to small cell or another endocrine driven tumor. And gosh, we're, there's some researchers working on that. There's some really cool stuff on, um, on resistance mechanisms coming out. Janet, I just want to jump in and, and say to Gail, uh, you asked if there's other cells, the ROS1 will only show up in cancer cells. The so you cannot, you, you have to have something to test if they can't find it because it doesn't show up on scans or whatever, there, there's no way to test it. Okay. And, and so some can on the, would they keep you on the drug? I guess it all depends on, you know, the circumstances, but. It depends on the resistance mechanism. I mean, there are some people early on when we didn't have any next drug, people would start taking crizotinib and it would be working well. And then they'd progress somewhere like in the brain, they'd zap the brain mitts or they'd pick up a different kind of cancer that was just in one spot and they'd zap that tumor and keep them on the crizotinib. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's only if you still have cancer that's being driven by ROS1. Um, there, some people have continued taking their ROS1 TKI and added chemo. Um, there's, mixed opinions as to whether or not it does any good, but I think a lot of people feel a little safer if they stay on the ROS1. We don't, we don't have evidence to prove that that TKI makes a difference, but it, it's not standard of care one way or the other. So, um, did I answer your question, Gail? Yeah. yeah sorry. I can get into the <laughs> geeky stuff pretty damn fast. Sorry. <laughs> You said that there's three methods of testing for ROS1, but we only got to two of them, I think. What the third was, one third? was IHC, immunohistochemistry. So there's 
there's the fish test, there's NGS, and there's IHC. And the the uh, the major academic cancer centers will, if they have enough tissue, do all of them. But that's certainly not standard. Some will also do liquid biopsy, but that's not sufficient on its own. Yeah, if you get a positive on liquid biopsy, the thinking is you can trust it and go ahead and treat for what it says. But if you get a negative, especially for somebody who doesn't have any of the other risk factors, they suggest doing a, a different type of test on tissue. Other questions? I found my I found my thing. PDL one. Oh. What is testing for PDL one mean? Okay. Um, PDL one is a biomarker used that's associated with immunotherapy. Um, the current immunotherapies that we use for lung cancer work on the PD, PD-1 um, pathway. PD-1 is programmed death one, and it's um, a protein that gets expressed on the surface of the cancer cell that says, um, ignore me, I'm normal. Um, if they have that, then those, the white cells have a PD-1 sensor on them and the cancer cells have the PD-L1, what they, L is for ligand, but they have a surface on it and the two of them connect. And then the white cell says, oh, okay, nothing to see here and ignores it. What the immunotherapies do is block that connection. So the white cell doesn't get the signal, ignore me and attacks the cancer cell. When you have a high PDL1 expression, that's an indicator that you can, that an immunotherapy might be effective for you. However, there are a lot of reasons why a cell, a cancer cell expresses PDL1. Apparently, for those of us with these driving biomarkers like ROS1, ALK, T, um, EGFR, our cells may express PDL1 for a different reason. And even if we have a very high one PDL1 um, test, you know, there are people who have like 100% PDL1, the immunotherapies usually don't work for us. They don't know why, still trying to figure it out. So it's a standard biomarker that they test for now because immunotherapy is a standard of care for people, except for those of us who have the biomarkers. I should also note that pretty much all of the data with very few exceptions about the association between whether or not immunotherapy will work for a biomarker is done with EGFR and ALK cases because there's a lot more of them so they get enough of them in the clinical trials. There have been a couple where they've actually tested it for ROS1 and there's no clinical trial evidence that it works for any ROS1 patients that are stage four. Um, so the assumption is that it, it's not gonna work for us. That said, we've had a few people in the group for whom it works and it's possible that that happens because their particular cancer cell has a lot of other mutations that makes it look enough like not me that the, the reason that it's expressing PD-L1 is, is different and the immunotherapy works for them. Um, but generally it, it doesn't. Does that answer your question? Okay. That's a big source of confusion for people. Their doctors don't know about that it doesn't work for biomarkers and they see high PDL1 and they say, great, give them immunotherapy. The current guidelines now say, wait for the biomarker test results to come back for all of the genes before you make a decision about what treatment, unless it's absolutely necessary. Thank you. I actually just brought a friend in for a, um and a procedure and I need to pick him up, but his brother just um, started chemotherapy for lung cancer and he doesn't, neither of them know anything to ask about it. And I just, I, I, you know, I, I struggle because it's so hard for when you're just starting out to even know what 
anything is. And I'm like five years in and I still don't know probably a small little tiny percentage of what I should know. So um, I should, I mean, I told them biomarker testing by all means, and I'm assuming that they just normally do that now. Is that correct? It's supposed to be standard of care, but it's not happening everywhere. Okay. So Um, you should definitely ask about that. There's a good list of questions to ask your doctor when you're newly diagnosed on the longevity website. Okay. All right. I'll tell them to look there. Thank you. And, you know, I had just have a, a, a random question, but, you know, five years ago I was diagnosed with cancer. They took my, they took my left lobe out, thought that they had it all. I don't, I don't think they did a biomarker test. Had they done a biomarker test because I didn't have any further treatment. And then a year later I was stage four, but had they done that biomarker test and it came back Ross one, would they have put me on crizotinib or I mean, this is like, it doesn't matter anymore because I'm stage four and blah, blah, but, but just out of curiosity, could they have put me on crizotinib and I not ended up in that state? Five years ago, if you were not stage four, no. Okay. In fact, crizotinib was not actually approved by the FDA until 2016. A lot of people could get their insurance to cover it because we had really strong clinical trial data that showed that crizotinib worked. But um, we still, a lot of doctors still don't know about it and don't prescribe it or prescribe the wrong thing. I mean, we had one person come in the group whose doctor prescribed electinib, which does not work for Ross one. So, okay. At this stage of the game, if, if that happened to somebody now, would they do it? Would they start them on? on if they're not the- stage four, um, data just came out last year. I want to say last year, but it might've been the year before because I can't remember anything anymore. But for EGFR patients who were earlier stage, it appears that after they go through all the first line treatment, they might give them, they can get longer progression-free survival if they start taking one of the EGFR TKIs after treatment. Specifically, I think it was osimertinib, but it hasn't been done for any of the other um, biomarkers yet. And there's still controversy about it because there's at the moment, it hasn't been around long enough. Just a second. It hasn't been around long enough to demonstrate that it improves overall survival. And that's their marker of they decide whether or not to approve something, but the FDA approved it for use for early stage patients. Um, I know in the, uh, we've seen some people in China where the doctors are prescribing um, a ROS1 TKI after um, surgery for early stage lung cancer, but it's not standard of care. So you probably wouldn't be able to get it covered in the US. How am I doing on the level of I'm explaining things at? Am I going too deep or am I answering your questions? It always helps to get feedback. Two thumbs up. <laughs> okay, well, three. A few. All right. I'm glad I'm, I'm it's um when I, when I first started out and I was, you know, a patient that knew nothing, it was a lot easier to stay at the right level. But after I've dwelled with the oncologist for too long. I start adopting their abbreviations and sometimes I don't explain things well. So sorry about that. You're, you're doing great. The amount of knowledge you know is wonderful. You, you help us every single call. In the hour and a half, if you get five minutes of something you really, really understand or the whole hour and a half, you still helped us. So thank you. Oh, the good. My heart. Thanks. I try. My dog thanks you too. <laughs> <laughs> One paw. <laughs> Two paws. Oh, <laughs> my cat would thank you, but he doesn't want to come downstairs. <laughs> so I find it a little frustrating because I'm in, uh, retired now because of this and something else uh, position, but I don't have subscriptions to a lot of the magazines and articles. You, you know, you have to either buy them or, or be somebody that's got access to them through a hospital library or something. So I, I kind of hit a wall sometimes when I'm trying to look something up. So it is helpful. 
have it in a condensed version <laughs> and not too uh, technical and not having to read all of this stuff uh, to learn some of this. Well, Sherry, are you a member of ISLC? Yeah, I am. You know that you can go to the, as a patient, you can go to all the conferences for free and have access. Yeah, I've been doing them. that. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing that. Yeah. And they've got the Journal of Thoracic Oncology access and so on. Yeah. There's, sometimes there's old, uh, older articles or other things. And sometimes I just can't get to read something I might want to. They also have summary articles in their IL, the ILCN used to be the ISLC Lung Cancer News. That's where they tend to write, you know, top level summary articles about the science. Yeah. I've been, I've been getting the newsletters. Good. It's been helpful. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, ASCO and ESMO and they charge. Yeah. So I, I pay for access to the meetings and then I download the stuff that I want, but um, I'm not paying for journal articles. However, if once you get yourself known as an advocate that is able to understand the science and, and trying to do something good with it, and you develop a relationship with researchers, you can say, hey, I can't get to this article. Would you mind sending me a copy? And they will. Mm-hmm. You know, subtly, you can't like blare it all over Twitter. <laughs> Did anyone watch the real world data um, roundtable last week? Gail I did. I was there. Yeah, Mary. Did you find it useful? Yeah, it was useful. It was interesting. Um, I, I I didn't realize who all the people on the panel were for some of their comments. That's probably the only thing. And you know, are they? Are they researching real world data now? Some of those people, or is this just uh, Every, wishful thinking? Everybody who was on that panel is a current Ross One clinician researcher in various parts of the world. And real world data is a very new thing in terms of trying to use it to make regulatory decisions. It's one thing to have a registry. A lot of people have registries, but the problem is the data isn't getting used by researchers to do anything. And so they've all expressed an interest in ROS1 research using real world data. So what the next step would be, let's collect it in a way that's useful to everybody. And that's what that round table was about. Did you, did you find the presentations up front helpful? Corey and uh, Belinda. Yeah, they were good. Somehow I missed that. Is what? How did we? Maybe I just didn't get any. Didn't read an email or something. How? How was it um, organized, or who was organizing it? I organized it. Oh, okay. Would that have been on the Facebook page? That I still haven't managed to figure out how to get myself on. <laughs> um. Well, actually, there was a blog on our website about it. Okay. So if you the website once in a while, then um, all right. You might want to subscribe to the uh, blog on the website. And this is I don't even the, know how to do that. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get my son to help me. Um, there's a, a place in there where it asks you to subscribe, or you can you can go to the contact and ask to subscribe to the newsletter, and okay. do that. But um, yeah, we realize not everybody's in the Facebook group. We did announce it in the Facebook group also, and we put it in our public Facebook page too. But again, not everybody's on Facebook. However, it has been recorded and it will be up soon. Oh, okay. On the, web, uh, the website? Well, it'll first be up on our YouTube and I'll, I'll um, put it up also on the website. Okay. But I have to go through and watch it. And it was three hours, so. <laughs> That's what I, I only I got to see parts of it and I, I'm waiting to see the whole thing. And yeah, I, the presentations were tricky. We had to balance between, we wanted the entire audience to be able to understand it, but we also wanted the doctors on our panel to get value out of it. And so we could have gone into much more detail on the real world evidence part, but I think you know what we did was a nice start. Uh, the fact is anybody can gather real world data but not all real world data is going to be sufficient to generate evidence the FDA will accept. So if we wanted to 
generate data that shows that people with cancers other than lung cancer could benefit from ROS1 TKIs. Um, we'd have to collect certain types of data that met the rigor that the FDA is looking for. And you can't do that with patient surveys. You have to use clinical records. Well, not all clinical records collect the same data in the same way. So how do you then build information from people smattered across the world to make sure that the information is useful? Is That's going to be one of our challenges. Do we know what kind of information the FDA would would need? Well, Belinda, who gave the presentation, is worked at the FDA for quite a while. So she knows what um, they're looking for. But the FDA is still trying to, they do not have guidelines that say, this is what you have to do. They're still trying to sort it all out too. I don't know if you're aware that um, back when entrectinib was being considered for approval, um, we didn't have a comparison of entrectinib, which gets into the brain versus crizotinib, which doesn't, to show that entrectinib would be a better first line choice when they were trying to decide whether to approve it for first line or second line, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. So Dr. Doble actually did a study using real world evidence. He went to a database called Flatiron, where various hospitals send their EHRs and they compile them and then they look for comparisons across things. And he pulled out a cohort of ROS1 patients and created what they call a synthetic control arm. He didn't have a group of patients on crizotinib to compare to the entrectinib patients. So he got a smattering of them with comparable characteristics from the Flatiron database. So these patients on Flatiron were on crizotinib and he had the clinical trial data for entrectinib and he compared it for overall survival and how they did with brain mets to try and help the FDA decide how to approve entrectinib and to argue which one should be the better first line treatment. Um, it was one of the first times that somebody had done that. And it, I don't know what influence it had at the FDA, but at some point we'll, we're gonna go ask them what we have to have. I don't know that they'll be able to answer, but we'll try. Do we have any idea how many of the people working and caring for people like us are uh, members of the International uh, Society for, or the study, International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer? <laughs> we would hope it's all of them, but because there's well, it's, it's so tricky to get everybody in the world doing one thing, but that seems to be one of the potential avenues for that sort of. If you, uh, activity once they decide what stuff they want to collect about certain things. Are you talking about the researchers? Uh, no, the clinicians. The clinicians? Um, well, and the researchers, I suppose. ISLC is actually more of a research organization. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people who are just clinicians who subscribe to get the newsletter and stuff like that, but they're not active doing stuff with the, the group. The people that are active and is lack are mostly researchers. Hmm. All that said, all of the people that were on that call are active at the international level on lung cancer research. And, and I, I believe they're all is lack members and they've all presented or been at world lung. So that's our big international conference. I was just thinking if they ever come up with a set of, uh, a template, as it were, about what information would be useful to share on some of these rare things, and they wanted to get it out to everybody who treats patients that have these things, what's the best um, sort of way to do that? Well, that's why we're doing the roundtable, um, mm -hmm. and we're working with longevity. Uh, we're kind of blazing the trail here. It mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Right. Um, Corey Painter and what they're doing with Count Me In is probably the closest, but that's still only based in the US because they have you know, NCI funding. Um, trying to do this internationally is just getting going. And there's a few platforms that have addressed that. Um, you know, All the regulations are different in different countries. And so we're, we're trying to figure out the best approach for doing that. But 
we can't go in and tell Epic or Cerner or the people that run the electronic health records to change the way they write their health records in order to accommodate our study. What we'll have to do is show the value in doing something and then hopefully they'll start to catch on. The, the group of people you brought together was impressive. To think that ROS1 is such a small percentage of lung cancer, and you said it at the beginning of the call, under 2,000 people in the U.S. and under 2,000 people reported globally. You know, you got the conversation started, and that's where it has to come from, a conversation. You would think collecting data is easy, but it's not. I'm an old IT girl, and... Um, <laughs> Collecting data is not easy. And when you start crossing international borders and HIPAA and, and even the basic question, even if you know what data you wanna collect, who gets to store it? So they were pondering just the basics. And if, the, if they knew the basics, they would jump to the next step, but they're trying to just get nice, sturdy basics. So at the end, whatever you report, somebody will believe and all that effort was not wasted. Yeah. So they want to make sure they have built a nice plan. And then they brought in the breast cancer study too. So it was a great panel. I thought you brought together pondering questions that seem simple, but they're not. <laughs> yeah. The data sharing piece is huge. I mean, the first longitudinal study that we set up, um, we had great hopes for it, but it was at the beginning of this and people didn't really have to think through all the implications because no one had thought of it before. And they ended up with a study where all the data is locked up at one institution and can't be transferred anywhere else because of the way consents were written. Um, in Germany, Bearwell tells me that until recently, data sharing was so locked down that if you wanted to get biomarker testing and your hospital didn't do it, you had to go to another hospital to get the biomarker testing done. The two hospitals couldn't talk to each other to share the information. So we're trying to build something internationally that will avoid those kind of roadblocks. It's, and hopefully um, that, that's one of the emphasis longevity has for doing international work. And so we've got them working with us and count me in is all over it. And um, we're trying to, to figure out things as we go and set it up. So we won't lose all this valuable data. There's treatment data of over a hundred Ross one patients locked up in that database in our first study that we will never see. So hopefully we won't let that happen again. And there's so few of us, that's like locking up a million people's worth of data in some other study. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a platform that was created by an, a group. Uh, one of them is Genetic Alliance. And it was founded by a woman who was actually, I believe an IT professional when her child developed a very rare pediatric disease and she was trying to drive something for them. And she was working with Illumina, which is the company that invented the NGS platform. And they ended up generating a, um, a registry-like system that has navigated the international uh, guidelines in Europe, as well as the US and some other countries so that we could have an international cohort in there and still share the data. And it gives the individual patient group a chance to have control over what studies they make available to the people who join with their type of cancer and allows the patients to decide what study they wanna participate in. Um, so there's people who are trying to work this issue. And we have, our next step is to do a survey about all the platforms that are out there and the databases out there to try and figure out what our options are. It might be worthwhile for us to try and um, set up a study with the researcher to go into the Flatiron database and see how much ROS1 data they have and what type of data they've got to see if we could generate anything from that to, as a proof of concept. Dr. Christine Lovely brought that up in the round table. How many members are there now in the ROS Wonders group? Pardon? 
How many members are in the Ross funders now? Well, if, if you look at the members in the private Facebook group, it numbers over 800. Mm. We know at least 100 of them are dead mm. and just didn't cancel their Facebook accounts. So we don't have an absolute accurate number. I tend, to, yeah. I tend to say we have over 500 active members because um, Facebook metrics come back and tell us, you know, there were 514 active members this month. And so that's the number I tend to use. But I think the most I've ever seen anybody respond to one post, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, was like 300. Hmm. So, I, don't, I don't remember. Yeah. I There's think we're well over 800. I can't recall the number exactly, though. The, it's a difficult spot to be in. There are people who don't want to be faced day to day with the fact that other people with their type of cancer are not, are not doing well or have died. And so they don't want to be in the group all the time because they don't want to see those messages. Um, and there are some people that they don't want the detailed medical information of that's going on. You know, they, they just want to hear happy messages. And so we get an interesting mix of people in there. Um, and there are other Ross one groups around the world that don't, that English isn't their first language. So they're not active in our group. They may have one or two people that come into our group. Um, there's a large group in China on WeChat because they can't access Facebook, but it's mostly caregivers because in the Chinese culture, you don't tell somebody when they're really sick. There's a large group in China that doesn't really let anyone know they're there because in China, you lose face if you're sick. You know, so there's a lot of cultural issues around all of this. But the Spanish people, the Spanish group is active in, in getting itself going. It tends to be, I guess, mostly on WeChat. Um, the German group is very active and um, Merrill's group in Belgium is very active. And Australia is awesome. So we have, we have little pockets here and there. But what the nice thing is, is because we know where those pockets are, the drug companies come to us and ask where they should be opening their sites for clinical trials, which is nice. That's what I was thinking. It sort of a, seems like it would be a willing group of people whose um, information they might be willing to share, <clears throat> you know, for the greater good. But yeah. Yeah. It's still difficult. It is. And it's also difficult to try and accrue enough patients in some of these studies because people develop different types of resistance and there's not that many of us to begin with. So how do you get enough people to, to do it? I think the repetrectinib trial opened, I want to say in 2017, and it's just now getting to the point where it can submit for FDA approval. So it's difficult, but we have our two new trials, the telotrectinib and uh, Nuvalent 520. And I think we've got three or four people now on Nuvalent and they seem to be doing okay. Well, we anxiously await in Canada, the FDA doing something because <laughs> it seems to start from there for us to get anything. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, that's, so that's one of the big reasons getting back to real world data that we want to collect this data and do it well. Um, so far, when other countries were trying to get crizotinib approved, we've been able to give them anecdotes from the group about the differences in quality of life and the number of people who are living longer, et cetera, but we don't have hard numbers. So what I'd like to be able to do is collect enough data that when once a drug gets approved in the U.S., we can have something to show other countries showing them why they should approve the drug. And I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the um, Canadian Lung Cancer Organization, and I don't have the right acronym, um, did a really good job for both crizotinib and um, entrectinib in contacting people who had taken the drug to try and compile stories and take it to your regulatory body to try and get the drug approved. So you can thank them for that.
Other questions? Well, while we're waiting, if you come up with something, um, raise your hand or make a note in the chat or something. But in the meantime, I saw a really cool presentation by Dr. Trevor Provona at UC San Francisco about acquired resistance. And I'm not sure I understand all of it, but you might've heard sometimes that people will get like met amplification, that somehow they seem to have more met genes being expressed than there actually are in the DNA. Um, and other people, there are certain pathways of resistance that get activated by all these oncogenes. Well, what they've discovered, and I think they were studying ALK, but it could be extrapolated to the rest of us, is that when these particular little proteins get created that are, are mutated, they form these little, I'm not using the right term, um, a nodule or a, a pocket within the cell that makes a particular cancer pathway get activated and start causing these resistance mechanisms. It was really fascinating. And it's the first time I've seen it. So a lot of it didn't stick. I'll have to see it a few more times, but there are several researchers that are looking at acquired resistance across all of the biomarkers that, that we're trying to keep in touch with and find out what we can do to help. And the Ross Wonders have enough money from donations accumulated that we're going to fund some research in the second half of the year. And some of it might go towards um, trying to do a proof of concept on the real world data. Um, we have to take a look, hard look at that. And some of it might go to acquired resistance or other things re related to ROS1. Um, but what we'll do is work with, with Longevity who has a lot of experience with this to write a request for an application, an RFA for people to submit ideas for um, research and then we'll review those and award a grant or hopefully more than one. It won't be enough to run a lab by a long shot, but $50,000 is enough to allow someone to do a study to generate data that allows them to apply for like a big NCI grant. 